I would like to welcome today in our studio Dr. Jana Abikova. She's a researcher at the Prague University of Economics and Business. And today we will talk uh, with her about her uh, topic research, which is humanitarian logistics and disaster management. So first of all, Jana, I would like to ask as a lay person, uh, what's this topic about? If you could explain it to us. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Janet, for having me here today. And if you check definition, mm -hmm. humanitarian logistics is all about plan, uh, mm -hmm. planning, implementing and efficiency and mm -hmm. effectiveness of flow and storage of material and information. Uh, but this kind of really resembles the uh, standard business logistics definition. Mm -hmm. What is different about humanitarian logistics is uh, then it's about alleviating suffering of people and mm -hmm. uh, it's about meeting needs of people who were affected by disasters or uh, some kind of, uh, of humanitarian crisis. So uh, what I always tell my students is then uh, humanitarian logistics is a logistics in specific context, the context of natural or human uh, main uh, disasters. And uh, if you think about disasters, uh, you always have time before disaster strikes, mm -hmm. after it strikes, and then you have the window uh, between, you know, and it can be uh, really small or, or wide. It depends on the type of disaster. So. Um, before disaster happens, you prepare. Mm -hmm. uh, during disaster, uh, you uh, support and you provide and you react. Uh, and then when it's all over, you just have to kind of recover from it. Mm -hmm. So um, these three stages, and we can simplify it and just say then it's before, during and after disaster, mm -hmm. it's called a disaster management cycle. And logistics is uh, super important during all of these three stages. And humanitarian logistics is responsible for approximately 80% of all uh, relief efforts costs, you know, and um, every year the number of uh, disasters uh, grow and also the number of people affected by these disasters grow. So if you pull all these three aspects together, then it's really important then, um, or it's really clear then even though logistics is supporting process, it's really crucial for the success of every humanitarian operation. And uh, thanks to social media, I would say mm -hmm. then all of us have seen the pictures from Ukraine or from Gaza or from other um, uh, war, war torn areas, you know. And uh, so we have seen destroyed bridges, destroyed buildings and roads and injured people. So this is the specific context I mentioned mm -hmm. a few few moments ago, uh, but it always doesn't look like this mm -hmm. because every disaster is different. So you can have humanitarian operations uh, in a more stable areas, you know, when uh, you have long term projects. So mm -hmm. it looks completely different than mm -hmm. uh, than what we uh, very often see in mass media. So, mm -hmm. but even though the context is slightly different, you still uh, need logistics and uh, humanitarian logisticians uh, work uh, work under um, very specific circumstances and under pressure and mm. they don't have enough time or resources. So that's kind of uh, very typical for, for this type of context. Mm -hmm. And Jana, you specialize in uh, this uh, field of research, humanitarian logistics in some specific field, for example, if these like disasters or how to explain it uh, differs in a regional context or, or um, if it's like in uh, Europe, or in Asia, what's your special specialization in this topic? Mm -hmm. Regarding my research uh, in the field of humanitarian logistics, I focus on uh, forced transit migration mm -hmm. and mostly in Europe on uh, the former Balkan uh, road countries. Um, this Balkan road uh, was one of the main uh, migration paths to Europe in so-called refugee crisis in 2015-16. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and I cover both, both the time uh, people spend in refugee camps and the living mm -hmm. conditions there, plus also the time they uh, spend on the on the move, you know, when they are actually going from point A to point B. And um, what many people don't know is uh, that location problem. So where you, when you are choosing the right location for something, it's also part of logistics, you know, it's location problem. And usually it's easier to um, 
kind of image and then you are choosing the right location for warehouse, but it works pretty the same with the refugee camps. Mm -hmm. Of course, the context is different because you can come to a government of a host mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. and just uh, tell them, hey, uh, give me some land because, uh, or give me this land because you have a group mm -hmm. of refugees and I, I need to build a camp for them. Uh, so it's not easy like this. But uh, on the other hand, you just uh, have some aspects you need to consider, you know, access to water, mm -hmm. Um, access to roads, airports, you know, uh, that you have enough space because, you know, sometimes you just um, expect that you need a refugee camp for 100 people and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you have 500 people or 1,000 who so just uh, need to know that the camp can grow. So it's always good to know what to consider when choosing the location and it's also a matter of logistics, even though it's not that clear at the beginning, you know, or on the first side. And a significant part of my uh, research um, is um, studying the living conditions uh, in refugee camps because um, I volunteered and I did a field research in uh, in a refugee camp in Serbia. Mm -hmm. So um, I still remember the living conditions there, lack of space, as I mm -hmm. mentioned, and a lack of privacy, like really there was just no no personal space um cold weather um lack of medicine just name it you know there are plenty of uh, plenty of problems and in some refugee camps the living conditions are even worse for example in greece in moria mm. where 300 people uh, had to share one toilet uh, mm. before the whole uh, camp was destroyed by uh, by a fire and now we have not moria one but moria two um in humanitarian sector, we have uh, so-called sphere standards, and they set the minimum standards uh, for, for example, the the number of uh, liters of water you need per person, mm -hmm. or the number of toilets you need for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to these standards, twenty people are supposed to share one toilet, not three hundred. You know, so uh, living conditions uh, is mm -hmm. a definitely uh, definitely problem in practice. So. Uh, that's why I want to uh, want to cover this area also uh, in my research. And then uh, there is uh, another topic, and that's uh, the moment when people are on the move, mm -hmm. when they really go from pay point A to point B. Uh, because um, plenty of researchers focus, um, let's say, on stationary people, you know, when they are mm -hmm. uh, in a camp or when they are uh, in a slum or when they live in a country or in a city with a host community. Uh, but then they have to get there, you know, mm -hmm. so there is really the moment when they are just going through uh, some area. And uh, when you have people on the move, they need different type of assistance mm -hmm. because um, they, uh, they need for example, bags, you know, mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. they are moving, so they have to carry their belongings in something. Mm -hmm. um, so bags or backpacks. Uh, then they need water and food and even spend the night someplace, mm -hmm. but not in a refugee camp, like in a really like a huge camp, but more in the smaller um, transit centers. And the location will be different in mm -hmm. the case of transit center than in a refugee camp. So uh, that was another um, another part of my research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if you should name them, like the name obstacles of the humanitarian logistics, is the communication with government, uh, hygienic, hygienic uh, conditions or living conditions, and maybe how to care about people who are on a, on a journey from yeah. some country to another one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. But. Um, this is not a very popular topic, but in uh, one of my papers, I um, try to find out mm -hmm. uh, what's the reason behind the whole chaos in Moria camp, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I use the so-called like a broken window theory and I was looking for the first broken window, you know, so where this whole mess mm -hmm. started and um, I traced it back uh, to the first broken window and uh, I, I identified that it was a, like a will, mm -hmm. you know, then uh, there is no political consensus or, or the clear direction how to assist uh, these people. And 
when we think, of, think about refugee camps uh, in general or humanitarian operations mm-hmm. in general, um, the problem and the challenge is the lack of resources, mm-hmm. uh, because even though the funding of um, humanitarian operations is growing every year, the needs are growing faster. So you are never able mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. support or uh, people who need that. So that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Jana, you also often mentions in uh, our communication and uh, our article that uh, different disasters uh, like receive different uh, attention, not only by public, but also by the uh, research world, I would say. So could you explain what you mean by it? What's the what's the differentiation in different like disasters or humanitarian uh, disasters? Um, yeah, uh, some disasters get listed mm-hmm. as, and pardon the um, uh, the word, mm-hmm. as uh, hot topics, you know. So mm-hmm. these disasters receive uh, really huge coverage by mass media mm-hmm. and uh, the whole world uh, talks about them and know then this is happening. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Uh, this uh, is also often uh, accompanied by grants going to researchers who focused mm-hmm. on this type of disasters. And uh, COVID-19 is a perfect example of mm-hmm. this type of like a hot topic. Um, with some exaggeration, uh, everyone tried to publish about COVID-19, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not saying then it's inherently wrong, you know, it's understandable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the problem is that Some of the papers published about COVID-19 were um, of very low quality, you know, and with zero or very low impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why I personally believe that the problem starts. Uh, I remember one paper uh, about COVID-19 preventive measures in refugee camps, mm-hmm. and the recommendation was wash your hands and uh, maintain a distance. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. But if you imagine these 300 people sharing one toilet, Mm -hmm. as I mentioned a few moments ago, then it's pretty clear Mm that it's difficult for uh, these people to, um, you know, wash their hands. Um, Plus, there is uh, another problem, and uh, that's that um, most uh, of the camps um, face first of all, lack of access to clean water and second of all, Mm -hmm. lack of space. So then it's also Mm -hmm. pretty difficult to maintain a distance when Mm -hmm. you have like overcrowded camps. Um, Plenty of practitioners uh, mentioned that it's really difficult for them to treat Mm. skin diseases in refugee camps because people don't have access to clean Mm -hmm. clothes because they don't have access to clean water. Mm -hmm. And everyone who is familiar with the context of refugees or disaster management, you know, and humanitarian crisis would know that. Mm -hmm. So that brings me back to kind of the the problem of uh, of publishing about uh, these, these hot topics. The varying attention different disasters receive is like an onion with a plenty of layers. Um, the first layer is that publication is with a limited impact really get out, you know, then someone mm-hmm. still publish them because mm-hmm. journals want to publish about uh, these topics, you know, the, the journals wanted to publish about COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Um, then another layer is uh, that researchers who are unfamiliar with the topic publish about the topic. Uh, as I mentioned, so then you have papers uh, that really shows it, you know, when you read it and when you know crisis management and disaster management, then you are able to uh, recognize whether the author is familiar with the context or not. Mm-hmm. Um, And uh, then there is another problem, and that's the geography, you know, because Mm -hmm. most of the disaster researchers are located in US, Europe or Asia. Mm -hmm. So then there is this disbalance, you know, uh, then uh, the um, disasters that are kind of close to the home of the researchers Mm -hmm. are well studied Mm -hmm. and disasters that occur in other parts of the world where you don't have disaster researchers are understudied. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's about this uh, this kind of difference among uh, among the disasters. 
I didn't think much about that until uh, one of my papers uh, was rejected because the editor told me that it's not up to date. Um, and it was about Moria camp, you know, and the camp still exists, even though it's not Moria 1, it's Moria 2. Uh, and the people still uh, struggle there and we st still don't know everything about the camp. Mm -hmm. So the gap is also re remaining. And um, after this feedback, I um, took a look on the um, disaster management research, you know, and how we actually work as disaster researchers. And um, many researchers publish uh, single case studies and we are not quite able to put them mm -hmm. together that well. And um, as we talked about, there is a strong uh, focus on a certain type of crisis and disasters. So... And there is also a problem with the link between uh, researchers and between practitioners. Mm -hmm. I um, met one PhD st student from India at the conference and uh, she told me that every year uh, plenty of researchers go there, collect mm -hmm. the data, you know, and then they leave without any further cooperation with the country, without any uh, will or effort to improve the country's resilience. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are also positive examples um, of teams of uh, practitioners and researchers working together. I don't want to sound like we don't have any mm -hmm. um, any good experiences, you know. I often reflect on a question I read in one paper, and uh, that's do we even improve our knowledge with the way how we design our research? I believe we need to uh, critically evaluate the way how we work, you know, and realize that we can do it better, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you or you often tell that it's important that research should help people and should be like practical. And you also cooperate with people in need. So I suppose that's a good opportunity to be more connected with the praxis. So could you explain us what's the uh, what's the difference in the cooperation or what you bring with your research, for example, to the NGO like uh, people in need is? I try to keep uh, these two roles, uh, researcher and mm -hmm. practitioner, separately. So I hope that my mm -hmm. uh, answer won't be disappointing. Mm -hmm. And because I feel that when you have like big overlaps, you know, then it can be ethically challenging. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's really um, important to work in the practice, you know, and um, be in a almost daily basis in touch with the practitioners mm -hmm. because I believe then it, it keeps my research grounded you know then you really see what what is the need outside you know mm -hmm. then I'm not just reading something and doing the research for for just the sake of doing research without any um, uh, any real purpose um, on the other hand, it can be sad and it can be funny at the same time when you um, do your research, collect the data, come up with some findings, uh, and then the next day or week you see it. Mm. And it can be something really good and it can be something really bad in the real life, you know? Mm -hmm. Or when you uh, find some information while doing a literature review and then once again you can see it with your own eyes. So uh, that's... Um, well, that most definitely shows then the, the research is uh, really good, you know, then it's really coming with the, with mm -hmm. the real life uh, facts or situations or, or mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, back to the research and the case study. You uh, wrote last year a case study about the refugee camp and it was really like a successful uh, case study. So I would like to ask what was it about, what you concentrated on uh, at this case study? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the case study emphasizes the importance of planning and mm -hmm. logistics while building a refugee camp. And um, I really like showing the different context to my students, you know, and at the same time show them that even though the context is completely different, they still need the same set of skills as they mm -hmm. would need if they would work for um, cooperation, you know, somewhere, somewhere in Europe and not on the other side of the world. And if you work for a humanitarian organization and you want to accomplish mm -hmm. something, you need uh, HR people, you need finance people, you need logistics people. Um, you move cargo, you move people exactly the same way. The only reason is that your customer is someone who is in need, who you have to support and uh, who 
And sometimes you are racing, uh, racing against time. So that's the difference. But that was really broad and, and wide uh, description of the case study. But more specifically, I uh, created the fictional refugee crisis and put students to the shoes of humanitarian logistician mm -hmm. who is on the side and has to deal with the, uh, with the crisis. And I tried to demonstrate the real life problems uh, while designing the case study. So um, I uh, pictured the problems of cooperation with the local authorities um, because in the case study, local author authorities sent an army to, uh, to the camp, not to provide support to the people uh, who were there, but to patrol them. Mm. And this uh, situation is mirroring what happened in the US after Hurricane mm. Katrina in New Orleans, where uh, US government did basically the same thing. So, uh, Jancha, thank you all for all your answers. Maybe I'll get uh, the last one to the end. And it's uh, if you should motivate or uh, like tell something to young researchers who start with their research career, what, what it would be? Well, I would start with a bit repeating myself from the interview we did uh, together. And I think then they should really go for a topic they um, mm -hmm. they love, you know, when they um, have their hearts in. Because mm -hmm. um, science and research can be really difficult sometimes, mm -hmm. even though it's really rewarding. So I believe then it's important to choose the topic wisely. Because sometimes we hear what we should focus on and how our research should look like based on um, the ideas or topics and preferences of our supervisors. So um, I just really hope that everyone can find the right um, topic and the right research team for them. So mm -hmm. that's... <laughs> So, uh, thank you, Jana, for uh, our today's interview and for introducing us the topic of disaster management and humanitarian logistics. Thank you so much for your excellent questions. Yeah, thank you. And to our listeners, just as you know, we will link uh, the Jana's case study to the podcast so you can uh, check uh, the publication if you want. And Jana, I'll be happy if we meet any time uh, in the future again about your research topics. Me too, thank you. Yeah.